So let me begin with session number three of advanced financial management. The topic that we are learning is investment appraisal. Now, in the earlier class, we studied and we revised how to calculate the present value of cash flows. We also discussed uh, the concept of annuity. We discussed the concept of deferred annuity. We studied how to use the spreadsheet function that is minus PV. Especially the focus was on how to find the present value of a perpetuity, right? And when we ended that session, we ended it with uh, the multi-growth model. Okay, for the first four years, for the first four years, it is not a perpetuity. We have to calculate the present value of those cash flows using the regular steps. And from the fifth year, we have a cash flow which would go, which would increase at a constant rate. Okay, that constant rate would be different from the first four years rate but that growth will happen in perpetuity, right? So the cash flow from the fifth year onwards will have the feature of, will have the quality of a perpetuity and not before that. So we, all, we saw a special formula. What was that special formula? Cash flow or the annuity times one plus growth rate, okay, which you can see on your screen. Cash flow times or the annuity times one plus growth rate divided by cost of capital minus growth rate. So that will give you the present value on the end of T4. Right? Okay, so, so this is another concept which we discussed. And then we have to rediscount it and bring it back to T0 by multiplying it with the present value factor for four years. Right? So this was what we, we, we finished off in the previous session. Now, this session would be dedicated to understanding the investment appraisal techniques. Now, you had this in financial management as well. So would they be tested again in AFM? Yes, they would be tested, very likely to be tested in AFM as well, but not in the regular FM style. Okay, not the calculation and not the number crunching. Okay, number crunching part would be there. Calculation part would be definitely there. But now you have to discuss those numbers within the context of the case study. You should be able to understand how to apply those numbers within the context of a case study. You have to also apply those four professional skills. You should be able to uh, uh, exercise skepticism in terms of the numbers that you have calculated. Right. Again, we have discussed this earlier, how to, how to demonstrate skepticism by challenging the assumptions. Similarly, uh, if you're calculating the NPV, you might be required to discuss about the disadvantages of NPV, again, within the context of the case study. Okay, They will not ask you, uh, you know, the, the, the AFM examiner will not ask you, uh, write the disadvantages or limitations of NPV. Right? It will not be asked directly. However, the question will be designed in such a way that you will have to highlight the limitations and disadvantages of the NPV within the context of that story, within the context of that case study. So the techniques remain the same uh, other than a few additions. I think duration will be exclusively the AFM concept. MIRR would be exclusively AFM. We are going to understand MIRR. We are going to understand the concept. And APV, adjusted present value. This is the most important. This is the most important technique which was not there in financial management uh, that we are going to learn in AFM, right? But let us start with the basic techniques. The payback period. Now, what is payback period? It's, it's very simple. You had this in FM as well. So conceptually, it's very easy to visualize. Let us say, uh, I invest $1,000, okay? I'm keeping the amount slow, uh, uh, small in my examples. So let us say the amount of investment is $1,000 and, and the life of the asset is, uh, the life of the project is 10 years. For 10 years, this project is going to give me cash inflows. So how many years would it be required 
to recover my initial investment right makes sense all of you those who are attending live are you able to recollect what is payback period let us say the initial investment is 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 $1000 and i tell you that at t1 okay let let me go to the spreadsheet okay so at t0 it is minus 1000 then uh, at t1 your cash flow is the cash inflow is uh, 300 at t2 it's uh, 300 again at t3 you receive 400 at t4 you receive 450 and at t5 you receive 500 okay now there are two types of payback periods which are those can anyone let me know what 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 is the first one it's called as the sim yeah tell me tell me for a simple payback period in which it's not discounted very good there is then we have a discounted payback period which is a part of your afm syllabus right which is uh very easy and reasonable okay discounted payback period is exactly like payback period simple payback period the only difference being we consider the time value of money we consider the present values of these cash flows the moment we consider the present values of these cash flows and then find the payback period it is called as the discounted payback period right now guys those who are attending this live can you help me out with the simple payback period how many time periods how many years would be required to recover this one thousand dollars three years yeah very very evident so we do something called cumulation of the cash flows so what would be the cumulated cash flow in the first year it would be at t0 it's 1000 so you have to just add all the cash flows so the previous cash flow plus the new cash flow so now it becomes minus 700 okay again the previous cash flow i mean the cash flow till date the cash flow till date plus the new cash flow minus 400 the cash flow till date plus the new cash flow zero okay the year the period in which the cumulative cash flow becomes zero indicates that this is the time period that will be required to to recover the initial investment okay now i've kept the numbers easy and i have also ensured that the exact number of 1000 is recovered at the end of 3 years but this is not always possible okay like if i add up the cash flows of the first three years 300 300 400 it is 1000 okay now this is easy what if this was uh let us say this was 500 this was this was 550 and this was 600 okay then how do we find the payback period how do i find the payback period you need to calculate the cumulative cash flows exactly like this start with t0 okay this will be thousand then you have to simply consider the cash flow till date. Okay, the same process. I'm not doing anything new. Okay, I'm not doing anything new. But the thing you will notice is you will not come across zero. You will not come across zero in your cumulative cash flow. For the first three years, it is negative. From T, I'm sorry, from T0 to T2, it is negative. You can see. And in T3, it becomes positive. But we need, we need the exact time when the cumulative cash flow has to be, the cumulative cash flow has to be zero. So that is the time when we can say that the initial investment has been recovered. So how do, how do I find that? One thing is very clear that my payback period, my simple payback period lies between year two and year three. That means my payback period lies in the third year. Okay. After two years and few months, I have recovered my 1000. So those who are attending this live, can you quickly tell me? Okay, now these are easy things. So let's not invest too much time in this. I want you guys to immediately apply your concepts and tell me the answer. What would be the payback period? Payback period would be two years and a few months. How many months would you think uh, should I consider as, my, as a part of my payback period? 
of course you can also find the payback period as a decimal okay two point dash dash years okay but i recommend finding out the number of months okay that would be uh, impressive on your part okay the examiner will be really happy if you calculate the number of months okay shruti has given me the answer it is very good 2.4 years or uh, you say 4 months Four months. Okay. Uh, I'm just calculating. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I'll tell you a simple technique. Okay. Simple maths. This is elementary school level maths. Okay. Very easy. One thing is certain that two years expires and I'm yet to recover 400 more. Correct. Right. I've invested 1000. Two years have expired. That means I have recovered 600. I have yet to, I have yet to recover 400 more. Okay. Now the cash flow in the third year is 500. That means 12 months, 12 months of the third year help me recover 500. But I want to know how much time will be needed to recover only 400. So 12 months equals 500. So 400 equals how many months? simple logic so 400 divided by 500 okay multiplied by 12 okay 4 by 5 times 12 months that would be the number of months so that would be 9.6 so roughly i would say 2 years and 10 months would be my simple payback period is this clear any questions you have with this Anything you would like to? Yeah. Is this is this reasonably clear? Yes, sir, it's clear. Okay. Now, what does the important part? What does payback period exactly tell me? What does payback period tell me? There should be something that it points to. What is that? Does it tell me, does it, does it give me a clear indication whether this project is good or not good, whether I should invest or not invest? Does this number tell me something on that front? Okay, if I tell you the, the, the payback period of this project is two years, 10 months, does it tell you something? Not at all. The, the, the simple payback period is two years, 10 months. So what? So what? There should be some target payback period that you are looking for. Okay. Let us say once you invest $1,000, you say, okay, I'm ready to give four years. If I recover my initial investment in four years, max, this project is, is good. Sounds good. Okay. That doesn't mean I'm going to immediately invest in this project. I'm going to keep this project as a, uh, I'm going to shortlist that project. Okay. And then I'm going to use some other tools like NPV, IRR, whatever. Okay. So guys, please remember simple payback period is not used to finalize the project. It is used only to shortlist the project. That means out of 10 projects, out of 10 projects, you are going to pick up those projects for further analysis, which are able to meet your desired payback period so what's your desired payback period maximum four years and what is the payback period of this project it's two years 10 months so this is quite quite reasonable it's non-risky project any project uh, whose uh, whose payback period is more than four years is risky according to you you have set your target payback period so if the payback period goes more than four years that means you would be taking more risk and you don't want to take it so you have kept a target payback period of maximum four years and not more. So this project fits within your target. So you will simply shortlist it and then you are, you are, you are supposed to use some more uh, tools for uh, such projects which, which are able to uh, achieve your target payback period. All right. So if the payback period is less than the target payback period, then accept the project. Accept not fully, except in the sense, as I said, shortlisted for further analysis. Any, any payback period which does not meet uh, the target payback period, 
you should not analyze it further. Okay, that is how you are supposed to take it. If payback period is more than the target payback period, then you can scrap it out. No need to do any further analysis. Okay. So always remember, lesser the payback period, better it is in terms of risk. I'm not saying that that project is the most profitable. I'm saying that project becomes automatically less risky because you are recovering your money fast. If there are two projects, one project has a payback period of four years, another project has a payback period of two years, then the project with a payback period of two years is naturally less risky because you are able to uh, receive your cash flows sooner. Right? Makes sense? Can you say yes, no? Those who are attending live? Yes, no. Perfect. Okay. Cool. So this is all about the payback period. Advantages. Now let's quickly go through the advantages. I'll read them out to you. Okay. Again, as I said, these are the basics. You can, we can, you know, just go through them quickly, but understand it. Okay. You may have to, uh, you may have to reproduce these advantages and disadvantages within the context of a case study. So you need to understand it. The, the, the biggest advantage of payback period is you don't have to go through some complicated procedures. It is easy to calculate, easy to understand. Okay. By the way, guys, let me ask you, what is the biggest advantage practically of the payback period? What is the biggest advantage of the payback period? In the sense, when can I give a lot of importance top priority to the payback period and maybe ignore NPV also. I may ignore NPV. I may ignore IPR. I'm giving top priority to payback period. When do you think can this situation arise? Anyone would like to take that question? Mm, so it's just a guess. If it's uh, yeah, yeah. for a short term period short term short term okay well not really not really what is the term that i use which which i use just a couple of minutes back to explain the advantage of payback period when is payback period most suitable what do you assess in payback period we can't say that a, uh, we can't say that payback period helps us to pick up profitable projects. It's not about profits. Then what exactly are we trying to beat? What exactly are we trying to achieve when we use payback period? What exactly are we trying to pick up? Which quality so, of the what? Uh, so, yeah. so if we are trying to recover what uh, we uh, what we lost, right? What is that one word? Yes. What is that one word which I spoke of? risk right risk riskiness of the project now this term risk has several different connotations we have a topic called treasury and risk management and in that topic the term risk has entirely different meaning so my dear students understand many students are confused with this word risk the reason being it has different meanings uh, in terms of different uh, as the context changes when the context changes, the meaning of the term risk also changes. So right now, the risk that we are discussing is in terms of the time. How quickly are we able to recover our money? If we're able to recover our initial investment quickly, then the project is less risky. That doesn't mean it's more profitable, but the only thing is we can say that the project is less risky. So my dear students, when is the situation when we give more importance to riskiness and less importance to profitability. What are those situations? Number one, when you are expecting a recession. Number two, when you are expecting some, uh, some political or uh, some social or economic uh, downturn coming up or maybe uh, let us say, now I'll give you a real life situation. Let us say I have invested in a project in the Middle East. Okay, and let us say, say there are some political tensions going on there. Let me maybe there is some war that can happen. Okay, so immediately when I when I when I get a feel that you know maybe a war can start in the Middle East and I have a project there which is going on, 
suddenly I'm no longer interested in the profitability because the situation is such that profit takes a back seat in my mind. I'm more interested in knowing how can I recover my money faster because if the war really goes bad, if the situation really goes out of control, then I may not recover my money. Forget about profitability, right? So suddenly I'll be concerned about recovering my money faster and not about the profits, right? Do you all agree? Yes, sir. Right? So in certain scenarios, in certain periods, payback period, as a uh, as an investment uh, evaluation tool gets lot of importance okay but in ordinary situations in, in in the in the normal course of business payback period is not used to choose the final project okay it is simply used to it is simply used to shortlist the projects okay that is what point number 2 is all about it is the first stage of evaluation. So if there are 10 projects, I want to shortlist four. So I'll use payback period to shortlist four. And then I will use NPV or IRR or any other tools to finally choose that one project where I can invest. So as an initial screening tool, uh, this is a fantastic uh, method. Now, it considers cash flows rather than profits. And that's why chances of manipulations are very low. Now, again, this is financial management concept. We have, we have studied in financial man management that profits are not always reliable. Profit as a figure, the accounting profit as a figure is not always reliable. It can be, it can be very easily manipulated. You can just play around with your accounting policies or you can, you can do some fraud and you can change your profits. Although we have accounting standards and all nuts and bolts in place, yet profit as a figure can be manipulated. Can cash flow be manipulated? Well, if you try to, you will be easily caught. Okay, I can easily catch any manipulation that happens with cash because cash can be counted. It's, it's a real thing. It's a tangible thing. The, the, the cash in your bank and the cash in your hand is something real. It's not a book entry. It's not a book adjustment like profit. And hence, this is considered as an advantage because payback period considers cash flows, okay? Something which is more reliable. It doesn't consider accounting profits. Payback period methods indirectly avoids risks to give favor to those investments which have shorter payback. Yes, absolutely. This is what I was discussing. It tries to minimize the riskiness. This method helps the company to grow, minimize risk and maximize liquidity. If my money, if my cash comes back to me faster, my liquidity position is better. And hence, I would always want to invest in those projects whose payback period is lower. In the situation of capital rationing, it can be used to identify the projects which generate additional cash for investment quickly. What do you mean by capital rationing? When is rationing required? I hope you have you know the meaning of the term rationing. Can anyone let me know? So the, uh, the, uh, I mean the portion of debt and equity in our capital. No, 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 no. Rationing. What do you mean by ration? Ration, ration shops, ration ki dukan. We have heard of this term ration. In Hindi, they, they say it ration. Okay. What is rationing? Rationing is required when the resources are limited and the consumers are, are quite high in number. Let us say I have one apple. I have one apple and I have uh, five people. Okay. Now, I can't give this one apple to one person because everybody wants their share in the apple. So I'll have to ration out this apple. I'll have to cut down this apple into maybe five pieces, maybe not five equal pieces. Okay. If I have set a criteria, okay, let us say the eldest member, okay, will receive a higher share of the apple. The youngest will receive the smallest uh, piece of the apple. Okay. This is one of the criteria. So it's not necessary that everyone will receive equal peace. Similarly, if I have limited funds for investing and I have 10 projects, 
I want all these projects to be invested into. I, I believe all these projects are good. They are fantastic projects. And, uh, and these projects uh, require, uh, require investments which are divisible. It's not that it needs a fixed investment. Five million, not necessary. It, it, we, you can run that project even with three million, with, with, even with $50,000. So if this is the situation, I can easily distribute the $1 million that I have between these 10 projects. That process is called as capital rationing. So when I have limited funds and multiple projects to be invested into, I will use capital rationing. And this year, where payback period can help me identify those projects where if I invest the additional cash, my recovery will be the fastest. Naturally, the project where the, where the payback period is the lowest, there the recovery will be fastest. So I can easily identify such projects by using the payback period. Now, what are the limitations? It does not consider a time value of money. Okay, that's the biggest limitation. It does not consider the whole life of the project, right? Like if I understood, if I understand that the, uh, that the payback period of this project is two years, 10 months, done. I will ignore all the cash flows beyond third year, fourth year. You know, I will uh, th these these cash flows will have no role to play now. This is this is also one of the biggest limitation. Then there is no specific criteria or rule which can justify that the company's target payback period is measured ac accurately, and that why it is difficult to measure target payback period. So uh, guys, payback period by itself doesn't tell you anything. You need a target payback period, but you, uh, but if you, uh, if you do not set a target payback period properly, if you commit any errors over there, or if you commit any error of judgment over there, then, you know, payback period will not give you uh, uh, any good results. If your target payback period itself is, uh, is, uh, is not properly calculated or is not properly set, then payback period won't add any value to your project evaluation. It may lead to excessive investment in short-term projects. It may lead to excessive investment in short-term projects. As I said, payback period doesn't tell you whether the, whether the project is more profitable, less profitable, etc. So if you are in the habit of picking up the projects only and only on the basis of payback period, then you may end up investing in those projects which has the lowest payback period but may not end up in profits. So naturally, the tendency would be to invest in short-term projects more. This is a limitation or the disadvantage of, a disadvantage of payback period. It does not consider the risk and uncertainty in the projects. Okay, Uncertainty of cash flows can deteriorate the results. Uncertainty is a, is a particular quality of the cash flows, okay? We have measures like standard deviation, value at risk, et cetera, which we are going to learn subsequently, okay? Which, we, which help us to incorporate uncertainty of the cash flows. Like in this scenario, I have given you a particular string of cash flows, but these are all assumptions, right? These are all estimates because I'm assuming 500 would be the cash flow at the end of the third year but there is tremendous uncertainty because it's about the future. So these kind of uncertainties are ignored or rather not considered when it comes to payback period. And finally, it does not focus on shareholders' wealth maximization. And hence, we have better tools like NPV or IRR, okay? And also now MIRR, which we are going to use. Discounted payback, as I said earlier, we'll also see one quick example of the discounted payback. The moment we, we discount these cash flows, the moment we bring the discount rate, the time value of money into picture, discount these cash flows, and then using those discounted cash flows, we try to calculate the payback period. It will be called as the discounted payback payback period. So it is the same. The procedure is exactly same like simple payback period. The only difference is the cash flows that we use for discounted payback are adjusted to time value. Right? Guys, are you all understanding these concepts? Are you understanding the discussion? Whatever we have discussed so far, is it clear? 
Yes, sir. Yes. Yep. Okay. Now, to calculate to calculate the payback period, the discounted payback period. Okay. Let's take one example. So, as you can see on your screen, the period. Zero, one, two, three, four. All right. What is the initial investment? The initial investment is five hundred thousand dollars. Hence, put in the bracket. Then every year we have three hundred, two hundred, two hundred, six hundred. Okay. So these are the cash inflows for the next four years. All right. So there is if now the question for all of you and those who would be watching this. Later on, can pause the video and think about this. What could be the simple payback period of this project? What is the simple payback period of this project? Let us, let us, two years. Two years. Yes, it takes exactly two years to recover five hundred thousand. All right, but now we are supposed to bring. The time value of money into picture. Okay, let's bring time value of money into picture. So we will discount each of these cash flows, and of course, the first one, the first one, we are going to discuss uh, discount at exactly one. So the present value will be exactly the same number, five hundred thousand, but all the subsequent cash flows to be discounted by the respective PV factor. So one point one zero to the power minus one, one point one zero to the power minus two, and so on. Okay, that will give you the PV factors. Multiply the cash flows with the PV factors. You will get you will get the present value of these cash flows, and this is what we are interested in when we calculate the. Discounted payback period. Okay, so now you have to ignore this part. You have to ignore this part once you are once we have calculated the present value and focus on these cash flows. So, guys, now tell me. The calculation part is easy, so I'm not wasting time in sitting and calculating the present values. I'm sure you guys already know. Now, I'm I want you to focus on this part. And tell me what could be the payback period. That answer that you get will be the discounted payback. So let us try to accumulate it. Let us try to accumulate it on a spreadsheet. First year minus five hundred thousand. Second year it would be minus five hundred thousand plus a positive cash flow of two seventy two seven hundred. I have to see. I have to see that period. Where the cumulative cash flow either becomes zero or positive. If it becomes zero, then we have a definite payback period. Okay, a very clearly calculated. But if it becomes positive, then we have to find the payback period, which is somewhere between those two years. Okay, the previous one plus the next cash flow is one sixty five two hundred. Okay, sixty two one hundred. It's still negative. So now we can add one fifty two hundred. Okay, the previous plus one fifty two hundred eighty eight one hundred. Am I calculating it correctly? Is this right? This is T zero. This is T one. This is T two, and it becomes positive in the third year. That means discounted payback period. Will be equal to two years. It, it, it becomes positive in the third year. That means it will be two years and a few months. How do I calculate those few months? How do I calculate those few months? In the third year. In the third year, what is the present value of the cash flow? One fifty two hundred. But by the end of the second year, how much present value that I'm uh, yet remaining to be recovered? How much? How much present value is yet remaining to be recovered so that I can 
recover my initial investment, it is still negative to the extent of minus 60 to 100. Okay. Are you all getting it? The present value of the third year cash flow is 150, 200 for 12 months. So for 12 months, the present value of the third year's cash flow is 150, 200. I want to recover only 60 to 100. So, so for 12 months, it is 150, 200. So, so 62,100 will take how much time? So again, the very same logic which I had used earlier at the time of calculating payback period will be equal to 62,100. Okay. The amount, the present value of the amount to be recovered divided by total pre present value of the cash flow of the third year. So 150, 200. Okay. Multiplied by 12. Got it, all of you? So 4.9, 4.9, very good. Shruti has given me the correct answer. Very good, 4.96. So roughly, roughly I would say approximately it could be two years, two years, okay, and five months. This could be the discounted payback period. You can also write two years, 4.96 months. That also is fine but it is better that we round it off. That looks more reasonable. Got it, all of you? Let me take a pause here to check. Are you all with me? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. all right. Now let's move on to my favorite, your favorite, everyone's favorite, and very, very important the most important tool, the number one tool used by investment analysts across the world to evaluate investment projects is the net present value, NPV, okay? First and foremost, at the outset, let me tell you, we are supposed to use in the CBE environment, we are supposed to use the NPV function. Okay, we are supposed to use the NPV function. What is the NPV function? You simply have to use equal to, okay, bracket, open the bracket, then write NPV, then open the bracket, okay, then the rate, whatever the rate is, okay, then the string of cash flows, Give the cell referencing. Close this first bracket. Okay. And then you have to, then you have to initial deduct investment. initial investment. So the initial investment has been written as a negative figure. You have to use the uh, operator positive. Positive operator if the, if the cash investment at the beginning is written as a negative figure. Okay. So T0 cash flow, right? So this is what will fetch you the NPV immediately. Now, if you want to know the formula, which is actually irrelevant now, because if you're using the spreadsheet function, you don't have to calculate the PV of cash in flows separately and PV of cash outflows separately. Okay, you have to simply use this function. But logic, uh, logic says it's nothing but the present value of cash in flows minus present value of cash outflows. If the NPV is positive, accept the project, if the NPV is negative, reject the project, okay? Now, let me give you some more insights. I'll take you to the spreadsheet and I want each one of you, those who are attending this session live, okay? And also those who would be watching this session later on, okay? To, to focus on these, these numbers, okay? And, and the discussion that is going to follow. So let me take one hypothetical situation, T0. T0, T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, all right? Now, let me tell you the initial investment is $100,000. First year, it is 300. Then you have 350. Then you have 400. Then you have 450 and 500. I'm just taking these cash flows randomly, all right? Now, I want to calculate the NPV of this project, okay? Forget about NPV. Let me tell you the cost of the capital 
the COC is 10%. What does that mean? It simply means that I have, I have arranged this fund, this finance, $100,000 is the finance, the capital for this project. I have committed the providers of this capital 10% return. Okay, I have, I have promised 10% return per annum. Right? Now, this project will be profitable. Now, listen to this. This is very important. This project will be profitable if I earn more than 10% because I have to pay 10% to the providers of the capital, right? So I should earn at least more than 10%. Do you all agree? Um, do you all agree? Yes, yes. Okay. How do I know that I have earned more than 10% or less than 10%? If I've earned more than 10%, you can see the cash flows, right? This investment has given me these cash flows. So have these cash flows returned me more than 10%? or less than 10%. How do I calculate that? How do I calculate it? Anyone? It's a simple answer. One line answer. I don't want your calculations. I want you to pause this video whenever you're watching the recorded one. And just think about it. How do I know that I have made more than 10% or less than 10%. If I have made less than 10%, then don't accept this project. If I made more than 10%, fantastic. How do I know this? How do I calculate it? Uh, so it, uh, if we discount all the cash flows we are receiving from the first year to T0, and if that yeah. is something more than, uh, you know, 1 lakh 10,000. 1 lakh. Where did 1 lakh 10,000 come from? Because, uh, no, sir, that is more than one lakh, then, uh, hmm. we, um, then it's profitable. Okay, okay, okay. Now listen, all of you listen. There are two ways to answer my question. Those two ways are the two methods. What two methods? Which are those two most popular methods to evaluate a project? NPV method, IRR method. Right. These are the two methods to answer my question. What was my question? My question is, how do I find out whether I have earned more than 10% on my project year on year? My dear students, remember, I have to pay 10% not only for one year. I have to pay 10% on this 100,000 year on year for five years because that 100,000 is going to stay with me. For five years, I'm not going to return it back. I'm going to reinvest it. All these subsequent cash flows are supposed to be reinvested. Remember that. Okay. So I will have to pay 100,000, the initial investment. I'll have to pay 10% on this 100,000 year on year. So naturally, I have to make more than 10% every year. How do I find it? How do I come to this conclusion whether I have made more than 10, less than 10? Two methods are at my disposal. Two main methods. One is NPV. Second is internal rate of return. The net present value method, internal rate of return method. Okay. Now, I will talk a little bit about internal rate of return. It is easier to comprehend it. It is easier to understand it. How do I find the IRR internal rate of return? Okay, the easiest in interpretation. Now listen to this. It is the rate of return which this project has actually earned. I want it, I want it to be, uh, I want at least 10% return. It is to just uh, to, to beat my cost of capital. That is the minimum rate I am expecting because I have to pay 10%. So naturally, I will expect a minimum 10%. But have I actually earned, okay, considering these cash inflows, what is the rate? Is it more than 10 or less than 10? If it is more than 10, let us say the rate of return is 12%. If the IRR is 12%, that means I have successfully 
beaten the 10% cutoff. I've earned more than 10%. So first way, calculate the IRR. If the IRR is more than cost of capital, the project is good. It is profitable. Okay. If the IRR is, let us say, 8%, then I'm earning less than my cost. I should reject this project straight away. Okay. So this is the interpretation of IRR. Now we are going to see some more interpretations of IRR, the definition of IRR, the calculation of IRR and so on. But first and the foremost, you need to have this, this bird eye view about what IRR is all about. IRR is nothing but the rate of return, how much I am making on this project. So year on year, I'm making 12%. Of course, there is a limitation. This is one of the limitations of IRR where I have to believe that every year I'm going to make 12%. Okay, and that is the point we are going to write in limitations of IRR. But so far as the concept is concerned, the concept says that IRR is 12%, cost of capital 10%. I have successfully beaten down the cost of capital. I have gone ahead of cost of capital. Good project. If the IRR is less than cost of capital, 8% bad project. This is one way to determine whether this project is good or not good. Now, connect this, connect this with NPV. NPV is an amount. It is not a percentage like IRR. Remember, NPV is an amount. It's an absolute amount. It, it's denominated in the currency, whereas IRR is a rate. Now, my dear students, if you don't have the IRR with you, okay, now pay attention. This is very important. If you don't have the IRR with you or you have not calculated it, you don't want to calculate the IRR. Yet, you want to know whether the IRR is more than 10 or less than 10. You don't want the exact IRR. Let us suppose, let us, let us assume you don't want to know the exact IRR. You only want to know whether this project has an IRR more than 10 or less than 10. What do you do? You calculate the NPV. Right? You calculate the NPV of the project. If the NPV of the project is positive, naturally the IRR has to be more than the cost of capital. You understanding? Now let us calculate it. Okay, let us now do the calculations of the NPV. Okay, I'll write the NPV over here. NPV. Now, what is the formula for NPV is equal to open the bracket NPV, open the bracket rate. What rate should be used? The minimum rate that I'm expecting. 10%. 10%. Yes. Comma. You have to take all the values starting from T1. Just select the cells from J26 to N26. T1 to T5. Close it. Got it? Am I correct? Uh, so we have to add the initial investment. Okay. You have to add the initial investment like this. Add in a sense, you're going to deduct it. Okay. So minus 100,000. But since this 100,000 is written as negative, I'll write plus because plus minus is minus. Okay. So you get the NPV. Clear? So what NPV do you expect? Positive, negative? Okay, right, right now it is as a percentage. Let me rectify it and write number. Okay, I want a number. I want an amount. So what NPV do you get? Positive. A positive NPV. Correct? Are you under, did you all understand this? Yes. Okay, I think the numbers are too big here. This is only 100,000, right? So I think I have unnecessarily taken bigger numbers. It should be 30,000, 35,000, 40,000. Yeah, this is reasonable. Yes, this is reasonable. So I invest 100,000 at the beginning and then 30,000, 35,000, 40,000, 45, 50. Okay. My NPV is still positive. 
first conclusion if my npv is positive naturally now you 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 guys those who are attending this live need to answer this i am saying if the npv is positive the irr has to be automatically more than the cost of capital why so what is the mathematical reason behind this so because npv positive is uh, means that we are uh, we are uh, earning more than uh, what we invested so perfect uh, perfect we, now I my question not... is my question is what is the mathematical reason the mathematical reason is always remember now this is a general rule there is an inverse relationship between between what discounting rate and present value there is a inverse relation now what do i mean by that let's immediately test it okay let's immediately test it at 10% the npv is 48032 what do you expect the npv to be if i make it 12% at 10% it is 48000 at 12% what do you expect the npv to be more than 48000 less than 48000 less less okay there is an inverse relationship can you see the moment i make 12% is the cost of capital and discount the cash flows the npv drops common sense because if i increase the cost the the profit drops what is npv it's a kind of profit right it's a kind of value addition so if my cost goes up if i if i make it 15 now instead of 12 i make it 15 this is going to drop to 29 if i make it 10 if i i'm going to reduce the cost the npv is going to enhance now if the npv is positive what does it mean it means that irr definitely has to be more than 10 okay why why so because we know if i discount now listen to this if i discount these cash flows at irr instead of cost of capital it will be a break even point now what is that what does that mean okay let me talk in terms of amounts instead of percentages let us say my just a different example sale is 100 uh, my cost is my cost is 70 okay i'll write i'll, I'll write minus 70 what will be my profit my profit will be my profit will be 30 right my profit is 30 now listen to this if i tell you if i tell you that my profit is 30 and my cost is 70 one thing you will definitely tell me is that my sale value is more than the cost yes or no because i tell you that i am making a profit of 30 my cost is 70 so naturally my sale value the inflow has to be more than 70 are you all are you understanding this which means which means if my sale is 100 when will be my profit equal to zero my sale is 100 when will be my profit equal to zero no profit no loss when the cost will be exactly equal to the sale same principle apply it if the cost of capital is equal to irr or i should say if the irr is equal to the cost of capital what will be the npv if the irr and cost of capital are equal what will be the npv zero what will be the npv zero zero and that is why they say that irr is the rate where npv is zero okay irr is that rate at which if we calculate the npv you will be returned as zero npv naturally guys are you understanding this please say yes no if no please let me know i am ready to repeat it understood okay now listen now listen i am repeating it again be very very attentive if i discount 
these cash flows that you see on your screen right now, if I discount these cash flows at IRR, whatever that IRR is, let's not be bothered about that. Okay, whatever that IRR number is. But if I discount it at IRR, what would be the NPV? If I discount those cash flows at IRR and find out the NPV, what will be that NPV? Um, so it will it be zero? It is zero. I'm repeating it. I'm not told you anything new. I'm simply repeating it. If I discount the cash flows at IRR, the NPV has to be zero. But is it zero right now? Is it zero right now? No. Hello? Right no. now, is it zero? No. That means 10% is definitely not the IRR. Because if 10% was the IRR as well, then I would have been received NPV at zero. So 10% is definitely not IRR. Are you understanding this? Yes. yes okay. Sir. Then, then where would be IRR? More than 10 or less than 10? Because now I can see a positive NPV. More than 10. More than 10. More than. Because if I discount, if I use a higher rate, to discount these cash flows, only then I will have a zero NPV. In this way, you indirectly arrive at a very simple, straightforward logic. That is, this project has easily earned me more than 10%. If I discount these cash flows at 10, NPV is positive, and we know that there is an inverse relationship between discount rate and present value. This gives me a clear hint that if you want the NPV to be zero, if you want the NPV to be zero, the rate of discounting has to be more than 10%. Right? Inverse relationship. So if 48,000 has to become zero, that means it has to fall to zero. NPV has to fall by 48,032 and become zero. So if NPV has to fall, rate of discounting has to go up. Naturally, IRR has to be more than 10%. Is this clear? Yes, sir. Crystal clear. Yes. Now, how do I calculate IRR? Please note down is equal to IRR. Okay. In the CB, in your exams, you have to use the same functions is equal to IRR. Open the bracket and consider all the values from t0 not from t1 from t0 right from the initial investment till all the uh, cash flows select the cells okay but before closing this you need to do you have to add you have to include a guess rate guess rate what is a guess rate nothing but the cost of capital you can use any rate by the way but i suggest use coc as the guess rate I write 10% or you can uh, give the cell reference and then close it. Is this clear, guys? Have you yes. understood this? Yes. So what IRR do I find? 26%. Huge IRR. My cost of capital is 10. My IRR is 26. And hence, the NPV is positive. Can you see how everything is in harmony? How everything matches? This means that this project has, on an average, returned to me 26% per annum, where my, whereas my cost is only 10%. And hence, I'm earning a positive NPV. Now, guys, if you want to make this NPV zero or very close to zero, what rate should I consider as the cost of capital? Near to 26%. Near to? 26%. 26%. Yes. So let me do that. Minus 550. Very close to zero. If you do 25.75, 3.59. Very close to zero. You'll not get exact zero. And that is the limitation of IRR. IRR is an approximation. You will very rarely find a rate where NPV is exactly zero. But even if it is very close to zero, very close to zero, that rate can be regarded as your IRR. Guys, 
make sense? Have you understood this discussion? Yes, yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. So the simple rules: if the NP of the project is positive, accept the N, accept the project. Why? Simply because the IRR has to be more than the cost of capital. And if the NPV of the project is negative, okay, when will the NPV be negative? Let us say cost of capital is 30%. Cost of capital is 30%, which is more than IRR. Just see what happens to the NPV. My IRR, IRR is 26%. Cost is more than that. Naturally, it will be a loss. Naturally, I'll be having a negative NPV. So guys, I hope the, this discussion is very clear to you. Can we proceed? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. Now I'll quickly take you through the advantages, limitations of NPV, and also give you a glimpse into the format of how NPV is calculated for a simple project. I'm saying simple project, okay? We are going to encounter some more complicated situations in the exams, but uh, in in FM in financial management, you had this uh, very simple format. Okay, of course we are going to use this format for AFM as well, but with some more uh, more complications, some some more items joining in this table. Okay, but broadly this would be the format. But before that, let's discuss the advantages and disadvantages of NPV. NPV takes into account the time value of money. Biggest advantage. And this is giving a better picture of the project's viability. It considers the whole life of the project, unlike payback period, right? Payback period doesn't consider the whole life. It stops the moment the initial investment is recovered. We don't give any importance to cash flows after that. But NPV, it considers the entire set of cash flows. It gives an indication about the increase or decrease in the wealth of the shareholders. Its decision rule is consistent with the objective of maximization of shareholders' wealth. So my dear students, whenever you evaluate a project whose NPV is positive, like in this case, 48,032 is a positive NPV. If you select this project, that will add value to your shareholders' wealth. And hence, positive NPV projects are selected. If you select a negative NPV project, if you select a negative NPV project, it will deplete the shareholders' wealth. It will reduce the shareholders' wealth. And hence, we never ever select, we never ever select negative NPV projects simply because it will deplete and destroy shareholders' wealth. It focuses on cash flows rather than accounting profits. Again, similar to uh, payback period. Yes, again, we don't give importance to profit, but we give importance to cash flows. It can also be used for projects with non-conventional cash flows. Very important. Note this down. Note this down. This is a this is a very important point. Now, the question that will come up is: What do you mean by? Non-conventional cash flows. Can anyone help me out with that? Can anyone tell me what do you mean by non-conventional cash flows? So in which we have uh, both positive and negative. Um, and yes, have... absolutely. Like say, for example, if this was 30,000, 35,000, 40,000, instead of 40,000 minus 2,000. Okay, so in the third year, there is no positive cash flow. Instead, instead there is an investment of 2000. Negative cash flows popping up in between. Okay, if negative cash flows pop up in between, or the second scenario could be if there is a gap, if there is a gap in cash flows. Let us say, first two years, there is a positive cash flow, then nothing. Third year, the pandemic came up, lockdowns happened, and for the entire year, the business was closed down. So zero cash flow. Then again, in, in the fourth year, the business again took off. The project was resumed. Some cash flow came up. So if there are such, such gaps in your cash flows, 
or if the cash flows are very uneven, there are negative cash flows in between, no cash flows in between, such cash flows are called as non-conventional cash flows. My dear students, remember, NPV successfully gives you correct results, accurate results, even if there are non-conventional cash flows. However, IRR can go for a toss. IRR can give you wrong results, incorrect results. This is a limitation of IRR. Okay. So to put it very simply, whenever there are non-conventional cash flows, NPV becomes a superior technique compared to IRR. It is better to calculate NPV and make decisions rather than calculate IRR and take decisions. Okay, IRR can, IRR may give you wrong results if non-conventional cash flows are present. It gives a better ranking of mutually exclusive projects. What do you mean by mutually exclusive projects? Let us say there are five projects that I'm eva evaluating. Project one, two, three, four, five. And I have to pick up only one. So if I pick up project number three, then project number one, two, four, five will get rejected. If I choose one project, the others have to be excluded. These are called as mutually exclusive projects. Okay. In such a scenario, I can rank my projects very well if I use NPV. Okay. Naturally, the project with the highest NPV will get the first rank. The next highest NPV will get the second rank and so on. Right. This is how, uh, you know, NPV is a better tool for non-conventional uh, sorry, it is a better tool for mutually exclusive projects. It assumes that the cash flows are reinvested at the company's cost of capital. This is another limitation of IRR. Okay, IRR believes IRR believes that the cash flows of the company, okay, of the project, the subsequent cash flows are reinvested at IRR. But that is almost impossible. One cannot maintain uh, IRR at such a constant pace because some new project, some, some new opportunity may arise. Let us say, let us say after two years, some new opportunity arise, arises where this cash flow that has been earned can be reinvested and that rate could be better than this IRR. But this project believes that no, we are still going to reinvest these these subsequent period cash flows okay at the project's irr only now this is a very very unreasonable assumption impractical assumption whereas npv believes a more conservative approach npv has a more conservative approach npv says that uh, well we are not sure we are not sure whether we will be successfully be able to reinvest subsequent cash flows at the project's IRR, 25.75, okay? Each and every year's cash flows would be reinvested at 25.75. Uh, well, we, we can't be so confident about it, but we can be confident that the subsequent cash flows will be reinvested at least at the cost of capital. This is called as being conservative. So NPV is superior to IRR because NPV is more conservative, more realistic in its assumption. NPV believes that the subsequent year's cash flows will be reinvested at at least the cost of capital. We can't commit that it will be reinvested at IRR only, but we can say that it, it will be reinvested at the cost of capital because if we are not able to reinvest at even cost of capital, it doesn't make sense in continuing with this project. So we have to believe that this particular, uh, uh, these particular cash flows could be reinvested at least at 10% every year. So naturally a more conservative approach is always appreciated. Guys, have you understood this? Are you with me? Yes. Yeah. And finally, NPV is technically more superior to IRR. Why is it more superior? Because it has less rigid assumptions. The assumptions are flexible, especially they talk about this assumption. Okay. So you do, you need not need each and every, you need not know each and every assumption, but you should know that the assumptions are flexible. 
with NPV and they are a little more rigid with IRR. This is the point you need to remember. Disadvantages. What do you think could be a disadvantage of NPV? Nothing on the concept front. Concept is absolutely great. Okay. But managers might find it difficult to understand the calculations if they are not qualified enough, if they have not studied financial management and if they are managing a project, which is quite possible sometimes, okay, then it's it's difficult to understand uh, NPV compared to IRR because IRR is a percentage, okay. It always makes easier to understand percentages, especially when we're comparing it with the cost of capital. So managers find IRR to be easier to comprehend compared to NPV, okay. <clears throat> it involves complex calculations. Well, this is just for namesake now because now we have formulas, spreadsheets, functions, etc. to handle the calculations. But yes, if you don't use these uh, shortcuts, if you don't use spreadsheet functions, then calculation, of course, is a tedious task. Uh, so this could be considered as one of the disadvantages of NPV. It does not take into account risk and uncertainty of estimates and scarcity of resources. Like when we calculated the NPV of the project, we did not give any importance to the riskiness of these cash flows. Okay, we are not certain that we are going to receive these 30, 35, 40, 45. We are not certain. There is an element of uncertainty. Some some out of the blue event can come up and can and and can completely uh, destroy these cash flows or can have completely different set of cash flows. Now this possibility is completely ignored in. NPV. Cost of capital used in NPV calculation is difficult to calculate and get subjective when we incorporate risk and uncertainty. And this is what we are going to learn in AFM. Uh, it's called as the risk adjusted cost of capital. Okay, this is a concept that we are going to learn later on in AFM. Uh, but if we ignore risk, naturally, uh, the NPV that you find out will be very, very subjective. It cannot be trusted upon unless we incorporate riskiness in your cost of capital. Uh, this particular cost of capital that is the rate of discounting cannot be trusted. The NPV calculated using that cost of capital cannot be fully trusted. So these are the disadvantages of NPV. So my dear students, do you have any query, any question to be asked so far? Any to be repeated or any concept you want to discuss? Nothing? No, no sir. Okay, okay. Now, you can see on your screen right now. the format okay this is a general format that you are supposed to use to calculate NPV okay you will be provided with the data where you need to calculate the sales for each of the year of the project will be will be given the term of the project it's a three-year project four-year project and so on sometimes uh, Sometimes the projects can be perpetual projects, very much likely. So you'll be given sales, then they will also give you at what rate the sales are growing or what could be the inflation. We're slowly going to include inflation in our calculations. The sales may grow and there could also be an inflation. Similarly, they'll be giving you variable costs which are growing and inflating. We are to also deduct the incremental fixed cost. We are not supposed to deduct each and every fixed cost. We are supposed to deduct that fixed cost which is directly related to this project, which is called as incremental fixed cost, which is a relevant cash flow, right? This was the thing which we, had, we were discussing when when we were discussing uh, the relevant cash flows so we are supposed to consider only those cash flows which are incremental because only such cash flows are relevant 
Okay, so sales minus variable minus fixed, you get something called operating cash flows. You have to deduct tax. You have to calculate tax on these operating cash flows. But guys, remember, here comes the concept of tax allowable depreciation, TAD. Now, I have not considered depreciation in either of the fixed cost nor have I considered depreciation as a variable cost, but depreciation definitely is an expense and it's a tax deductible expense, which means whenever I charge depreciation, it saves tax. Okay, do you all agree? It saves tax. Is this clear? Or should I give you an example of what do you mean by TAD? If you, if you tell me, I'll, I'll give you an example because this is a FM concept. But if you know, then we'll proceed. Okay, now, okay, let me give you an example. Let us say sales is 1000. Variable costs, all the business variable costs, the cash costs are, let us say, 500. Whereas the fixed cash costs are 100. Okay, and depreciation, which is not a cash cost, you don't pay depreciation to anyone. Depreciation, depreciation is a very unique expense because it depends on your investment in fixed assets. So let us say the depreciation expense is uh, is uh, fifty. So what will be your profit? Your profit will be. 350, right? What will be the tax? Tax at 30% minus 0 0.3 times 350, 105. So your profit after tax, okay, is, is equal to 350 minus 105. It will be 245. Now, what do you mean by, what do you mean by tax? shield okay or tax also called as tax savings how do depreciation save tax now guys you can notice that i have considered depreciation before tax correct are you understanding i calculate my profit after deducting depreciation you deduct depreciation then you have profit before tax and then i calculate my tax on that profit before tax, which means, which simply means, had there been no depreciation, let us say depreciation was zero. Let us say depreciation was zero. What do you think would happen to tax? Will it increase or will it decrease? Decrease. I mean increase, sorry. Increase. Mm -hmm. Let us do it. Right now the tax is 105. I make it zero. Tax becomes 120. Can you clearly see it? Yes. Sir. When it was, when there was a depreciation, the tax was 105. When there is no depreciation, the tax is 120. So how much is the saving? Depreciation has saved $15 of tax. That $15 is called as depreciation tax allowable. That, 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 that particular concept is called as tax shield. And this 50 is called as TAD. This is called as TAD tax allowable depreciation. How do I find the tax shield as a formula? You can simply say TAD, TAD multiplied by the tax rate. So what is your TAD? Your TAD is 50 multiplied by 30% is my tax rate. So you find it to be 15. You can see that exact $15 are saved. If there is no depreciation, Tax is 120. If there is depreciation, tax is 105. So 120 minus 105, that is the tax I save. And if it is a saving, it has to be a cash inflow. So first I will deduct 105. I'm sorry. First I'll deduct 120, right? We don't consider TAD like this. I'll make it zero. So what is my tax? This is my operating. I'll call this as operating cash flow operating cash flow 
right? I have used the same format: sales minus variable cost minus incremental fixed cost in the operating cash flow, right? Thousand minus five hundred minus uh, three hundred. Uh, operating cash flow is four hundred. What will be the tax? Tax is one twenty. But now I know that there is a tax. Uh, there is depreciation involved. So what do I do? I simply do tax saving. Tax savings. How much tax have I saved? I have saved. What is my depreciation, which I have calculated separately? Fifty multiplied by thirty percent. Okay, so four hundred minus one twenty plus fifteen, two hundred and ninety-five will be my cash flow. Make sense, all of you? Have you all understood this? Yes, sir. Yep. All of you, have you understood this? How depreciation is presented in your in your calculation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of course. Now, of course, there are alternative ways as well where you can actually include TAD as a part of your calculation. So deduct TAD, add it back later on, which you have studied in financial management. There is a way. Okay, there is an alternative method. Okay, where you deduct and you add back. Okay, so there are three methods actually, but right now we are discussing the most popular, sophisticated method, which we are going to use in AFM. So you calculate your operating cash flow without deducting depreciation, calculate tax without considering depreciation, and then consider the tax savings that you make on depreciation and simply add those savings because why are we adding? Because it puts cash in my pocket. Savings always put cash in my pocket, right? So 295 would be your cash flow, right? So once you have that cash flow, then you have to consider the other cash flows. After tax savings, you have change in working capital. Then initial investment that will happen at T0. You're also going to uh, uh, employ working capital, right? You're going to employ working capital in your project. Now you have to check whether the working capital has to be introduced every year. But sometimes you also need to withdraw work, excess working capital. So withdrawing of the excess working capital will be an inflow. Introducing of working capital will be an outflow. Okay, we'll see that when we solve the questions. Scrap value at the end of the project. Yes, it's a cash inflow. At the end of it, you'll have the net cash flows for each year starting from T0 to T4. And this is what we are going to use in our NPV calculations. We are not going to find out discounting factor and all. As we have discussed earlier in the CB environment, we are going to use the NPV function, which I've already taught you. So guys, this would be broadly the format that we are supposed to use when we, when we calculate the NPV of the project. So more on this, when we, when we actually solve questions, numericals, it will be more clear to you. Guys, have you understood the discussion so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so I think enough for today. Please uh, watch this part. Now, what was important, what is really important is the discussion, okay? If you notice, if you really notice, these are the concepts which you must have been, you must have already studied, right? You must have already studied in your, uh, in your AFM, uh, in your FM. True? Yes. But what was, what was the new part? What did you learn then? In today's session, was it just was it was it just a repetition of FM? It Do you think this was just it. yes? So if you have, as I told you right on day one, it's the mindset and the approach. Payback period, you were already aware of NPV, you were already aware of, but now we are going to dig deeper into the concept. And uh, okay, now the number crunching is understood. The concept is understood, advantage, limitations, everything has been understood. Now we are going to apply it in a case study. In practical scenarios, how to actually apply all these things and how to write reports. 
They're going to write all of these in a report format or in a discussion format. That is the thing that we are supposed to learn for years. Okay, and of course, we are going to learn it slowly as we uh, venture into the exam kit questions, when we actually see how to, how when we actually apply it, then it will be fully understood. But right now you have to, you have to gather, you have to absorb as much as concept and logic behind these terms. Okay, so today we completed payback period, discounted payback period, the calculation part, the NPV, uh, the calculation part, as well as the logic part. And also I've discussed to some extent the IRR because Whenever I discuss NPV, parallelly IRR also has to be discussed. Okay, but later on, in the next session, we are going to actually go deeper into IRR. Only, only the IRR, IRR and the MIR. Okay, that will deserve a separate uh, lecture and we are going to discuss it over there. Okay, guys, any questions you have? Anything you want to ask? No, can we end the session for today? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. See you next time with a uh, new series of concepts. Okay. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.